bad dreams, huh? Well, it is real, sort of. You see, part of being a Grey Warden is being able to hear the Darkspawn. That's what your dream was, hearing them. The Archdemon, it talks to the Horde, and we feel it just as they do. That's why we know this is really a blight. I don't know if it's really a dragon, but it sure looks like one. But yes, that's the Archdemon. It takes a bit, but eventually you can block the dreams out. Some of the older Grey Wardens say they can understand the Archdemon a bit, but I sure can't. Anyhow, when I heard you thrashing around, I thought I should tell you. It was scary at first for me too. That's what I'm here for, to deliver unpleasant news and witty one-liners. Anyhow, you're up now, right? Let's pull up camp and get a move on. What do you need? You don't have to do that. I know you didn't know him as long as I did. I... I should have handled it better. Duncan warned me right from the beginning that this could happen. Any of us could die in battle. I shouldn't have lost it, not when so much is riding on us, not with the blight and... and everything. I'm sorry. I'd like to have a proper funeral for him. Maybe once this is all done, if we're still alive. I don't think he had any family to speak of. I think he came from High Eber, or so he said. Maybe I'll go up there sometime, see about putting up something in his honor. I don't know. Have you had someone close to you die? Not that I mean to pry, I'm just... Oh, oh, of course. How stupid of me to forget. Here I am, going on and on about Duncan, and you... I am so sorry. Thank you. Really, I mean it. It was good to talk about it, at least a little. That's good to hear. It's nice to know I'm not the only one who remembers him well. I could get used to this, you know. Something on your mind? Of course. Essentially, they're trained to fight. The Chantry would tell you that the Templars exist simply to defend. But don't let them fool you. They're an army. The other main purpose for a Templar is, of course, to hunt mages. To that end, we train in talents that drain mana and disrupt spells. You'd think that, but it's not so. The Chantry keeps a close rein on its Templars. We are given Lyrium to help develop our magical talents, you see. Which means we become addicted. And since the Chantry controls the Lyrium trade with the Dwarves, well, I'm sure you can put two and two together. Well, they do it, and they feel perfectly justified. You don't need Lyrium in order to learn the Templar talents. Lyrium just makes Templar's talents more effective, or so I was told. Maybe it doesn't even do that. The Chantry usually doesn't let their Templars get away, either, so they can spread their secrets. I'm a bit of an exception. Lucky me. Something on your mind? Of course. Sure, I could. I could even teach you, I suppose. 
anyone who's been trained as a warrior. I guess if I'm going to give up Chantry secrets, I may as well go all the way. Send whoever you want trained to me in camp, and I'll see what I can do. Something on your mind? Of course. Such as they are. That's a good question. There's plenty in Orlais, but who knows where they might be found. And the nearest Orlesian city is weeks away. If we go north and cross the sea, there's bound to be some in the free marches. Again, however, I just don't know where. I don't know anything about Grey Wardens in other lands. Here in Ferelden, there's our compound in Denerim at the palace, but that's it. Loghain will have control over that and be watching it, no doubt. Beyond that, the only place I know of is Weishaupt Fortress. That's the headquarters of all Grey Wardens in the Anderfeld, a thousand miles from here. But I've no idea how to even contact them. So unless we try to get back to the compound in Denerim, I suppose the answer is no. There's nowhere for us to go. I imagine that eventually the Grey Wardens outside of Ferelden will wonder what's happened. Why there's no contact from Duncan or someone. They'll send someone eventually. Though who knows what Loghain's people in Denerim will tell them. Maybe they won't send anyone. We could try to contact them. But that would mean leaving Ferelden, and even if we did, they couldn't come back with us in time to stop the Blight. So that means whatever happens, it's up to us. I mean, eventually we would have to use the joining to make more Grey Wardens, right? But I don't know how to do the joining, or what. I know it involves Lyrium and some other magic, and that it's really difficult to prepare, but that's it. Unless we can find out more about the joining, I guess we better get used to the idea that there might only be two of us for now. Until more come from elsewhere. Just left? You mean just left for Elden? I don't know. If there's an archdemon, however, we're supposed to be the only ones who can defeat it. And that means the blight would grow unchecked. Eventually, other Grey Wardens in Orlay and other lands would hear about it, and they would come to fight it, but they wouldn't come in time to save Ferelden. There's no way. I'm not going anywhere. About the Grey Wardens, anyhow. Fair enough. Something on your mind? Of course. Same way you did. You drink some blood, you choke on it, and pass out. You haven't forgotten already, have you? <coughs> I do my best. <laughs> what can I say? Let's see, I was in the Chantry before. I trained for many years to become a Templar, in fact. That's where I learned most of my skills. You're telling me I was banished to the kitchens to scour the pots more times than I can count. And that's a lot. I, I can count pretty high. The Grand Cleric didn't want to let me go. Duncan was forced to conscript me, actually, and was she ever furious when he did? I thought she was going to have us both arrested. I was lucky. I wondered that myself. It's not as if she valued me highly. I think she just didn't want to give anything to the Grey Wardens, is all. The Chantry didn't lose much. And I think I can do more fighting the Blight anyhow, rather than sitting in a temple somewhere. I'll always be thankful to Duncan for recruiting me. If it hadn't been for him, you know, I would never... I wouldn't have. He was. A good man who didn't deserve his fate. That much I'm sure of. Come on, let's go. I think I'm done talking. Something on your mind? Of course. Did I say that? I meant that dogs raised me. Giant slobbering dogs from the Anderfells. A whole pack of them, in fact. 
Well, they were flying dogs, you see. Surprisingly strict parents, too, and devout Andrastians to boot. Oh, there you go, listening to me again. You'd think you'd have gotten past that already. I ended up in the Chantry, sure, but I didn't start there. Let's see, how do I explain this? I'm a bastard! And before you make any smart comments, I mean the barbarous kind. My mother was a serving girl in Redcliffe Castle who died when I was very young. Our Lehman wasn't my father, but he took me in anyhow and put a roof over my head. He was good to me, and he didn't have to be. I respect the man, and I don't blame him anymore for sending me off to the Chantry once I was old enough. Our Lehman eventually married a young woman from Orlais, which caused all sorts of problems between him and the king because it was so soon after the war. But he loved her. Anyhow, the new Arlesa resented the rumors which pegged me as his bastard. They weren't true, but of course they existed. The Isle didn't care, but she did. So off I was packed to the nearest monastery at age ten. Just as well. The Arlesa made sure the castle wasn't a home to me by that point. She despised me. Maybe. She felt threatened by my presence, I can see that now. I can't say I blame her. She wondered if the rumors were true herself, I bet. I remember I had an amulet with Andraste's holy symbol on it. The only thing I had of my mother's. I was so furious at being sent away, I tore it off and threw it at the wall and it shattered. Stupid, stupid thing to do. The Isle came by the monastery a few times to see how I was, but I was stubborn. I hated it there, and blamed him for everything. And eventually, he just stopped coming. And raised my dogs. Or, I may as well have been, the way I acted. <laughs> yeah, but maybe all young bastards act like that. I don't know. All I know is that the Isle is a good man and well-loved by the people. He also was King Caelan's uncle, so he has a personal motivation to see Loghain pay for what he did. Anyway, that's really all there is to the story. Something on your mind? Of course. Have you seen the uniform? It's not only stylish, but well made. I'm a sucker for good tailoring. That's just in public. In private, we have these yellow and purple tunics, right? Much more comfortable, and you don't break the beds when you jump on them during a pillow fight. I'd use my shield if I could, but I think you might actually spot me hiding behind it. You don't really want to know about my being a Templar, do you? It's really quite boring. Poke, poke, poke. Tell me everything about your life, Alistair. All right, if you insist. It's not like we have anything better to do, right? The truth of the matter is that I did hate going to the monastery. The initiates from poor families thought I put on airs, while the noble ones called me a bastard and ignored me. I felt like Al Eamon had cast me off, unwanted, and I was determined to be bitter. But I took some solace in the training itself, I guess. I was actually quite good at it. The education, mostly, but also the discipline. You need to have a disciplined mind in order to use the abilities we have. It was difficult, but rewarding. I never really felt at home anywhere, though, until I joined the Grey Wardens. And Duncan felt my Templar abilities might be useful for when we encountered Darkspawn magic, so I kept it up. What about you? Do you have anywhere you consider home? Right. Stupid of me to ask. I'm sorry. We won't always be traveling like this, you know. Once the war is over, once the blight is... Well, a time will come when we'll have to think about having a real home again. Though that seems like a far ways off. 
And I suppose the Grey Wardens are gone for good. But either way. I suppose you're right. We can create new Grey Wardens, but we'll never get back those we lost. I wonder if it would ever feel the same. Anyhow, now I've sidetracked us. We'd better get back to what we're supposed to be doing right now. Something on your mind? Of course. Never, never what? Had a good pair of shoes? I'm not sure I do. Have I never seen a basilisk? Ate jellied ham? Have I never licked a lamppost in winter? Oh, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, if you really want to know, you tell me first. And apparently you have no shame as well. <laughs> well, all right, I'll play along. I myself never had the pleasure. Not that I haven't thought about it, of course. But, you know. Well, living in the Chantry is it's not exactly a life for rambunctious boys. They, they raised me to be a gentleman. That's not so bad, is it? I've uh, no urge to rush into anything. We, we may not even survive what is to come, after all. Enough. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's go. Something on your mind? Of course. You mean, other than becoming a Grey Warden? Hmm. You know, I asked Duncan this too. And all I got was, you'll see. Oh, it's not that Duncan wants to keep it a secret. It's just that the Grey Wardens don't discuss it much. I gather it's not a pleasant topic. The first change I noticed was an increase in appetite. I used to get up in the middle of the night and raid the castle larder. I thought I was starving. I'd slurp down every dinner like it was my last, and <laughs> my face all covered in gravy. When I'd look up, the other Grey Wardens would stare, then laugh themselves to tears. Really? I saw you eating dinner the other day. Savage. <laughs> Ah, yes, the classy camaraderie of two men traveling out in the open. I take it you were like this before the joining, then. Oh, and then there were the nightmares. Duncan said it was part of how we sense the darkspawn. We tap into their, well, I don't know what you call it, their group mind. And when we sleep, it's even worse. You learn to block it out after a while, but at first it's hard. It's supposed to be worse for those who join during a blight. How is it for you? Some people never have much trouble, but that's rare. Others have trouble sleeping their entire life. They're just more sensitive, I suppose. Everyone ends up the same, though. Once you reach a certain age, the real nightmares come. That's how a Grey Warden knows his time has come. Oh, that's right. We never had time to tell you that part, did we? Well, in addition to all the other wonderful things about being a Grey Warden, you don't need to worry about dying from old age. You've got 30 years to live. Give or take. The taint. It's a death sentence. Ultimately, your body won't be able to take it. When the time comes, most Grey Wardens go to Orzammar and die in battle rather than waiting. It's tradition. You'll always find Darkspawn down where the Dwarves are. The oldest Grey Wardens head to the Deep Roads for one last glorious battle. Not that there's a shortage of Darkspawn during a Blight, but that's the tradition. The Dwarves respect us for it. And you wondered why we kept the joining a secret from the new recruits. Well, there you have it. You know, Duncan, he started having nightmares again. He told me that in private. He said it wouldn't be long before he'd go to Orzammar himself. I guess he got what he wanted. I just wish it had been something worthy of him. 
I know. Ending the blight should make this all worthwhile, right? Something on your mind? Of course. I didn't know them for very long, but I guess it was longer than you. You never met them all, did you? They were quite a group. Actually, they felt like an extended family, since we were all cut off from our former lives. We also laughed more than you'd think. There was this one time... Well, you probably don't want to hear stories about men you didn't know. There was one Grey Warden who came all the way from the Anderfels. What was his name? Gregor... Gregor... He was a burly man with the biggest, fuzziest beard you've ever seen. And the man could drink? He drank all the time, but he never got drunk. Finally, we all made a pool to see just how many pints it would take to put him under the table. Sometimes, we were kin of a sort. All of us had gone through the joining, so we knew... Well, anyhow, it doesn't have to be deadly serious all the time. Anyhow, we never did find out. He said he'd drink a pint for every half pint that the rest of us drank. He was still going by the time the rest of us were passed out. I'm told that Duncan walked in later on and saw us all passed out from one end of the hall to the other, and Gregor still drinking. <laughs> Duncan laughed until he nearly... Until... Yes, I... I suppose so. I thought I was done with this, but... It just struck me that I have nothing to remember Duncan by. Nothing at all. There's no body, not even a token of his, that I could take with me. That must sound really stupid to you. I just would have liked something of his to take with me, that's all. Well, there's no use in moaning about it, is there? He's gone. Let's just go. I'm wondering something. I'd like to know your thoughts about some of our traveling companions. Do you mind if I ask? What about Sten? The way he looks at me with those eyes. Creepy. And he's so quiet for someone so big. The more I talk to him, the more reasonable he does seem. His philosophy is so strange. But it doesn't sound at all as wild as Chantry describes it. And yet, he killed all those people. He doesn't even deny it. Doesn't that bother you? Yet he seems otherwise honorable and even wise. I don't get it. What about Liliana? Is she crazy? Or do you really believe in her vision? That's one way to put it. I don't know what to make of her. If you look at her when she doesn't see you, she just looks so... so sad. I almost feel guilty taking her away from her life. Yes, I know. Still, I feel badly for her. Morrigan, do you trust her? Think about it. Maybe Flemeth sent her with us for some other reason than she said. Well, aside from the fact that she's a complete and utter bitch, no, I don't like her at all. Why, do you? Great. I am thrilled beyond words. Now, really, enough. I think my curiosity is sated. Let's get back to it, shall we? Something on your mind? Of course. Such as they are. About the... something on your mind? Wonderful thought. I don't know what to say. 
Yes. Well, here I am. I knew this would come up sooner or later. I don't know how to explain, but I had a dream. In it, there was an impenetrable darkness. It was so dense, so real. And there was a noise, a terrible, ungodly noise. I stood on a peak and watched as the darkness consumed everything. And when the storm swallowed the last of the sun's light, I... I fell. And the darkness drew me in. I suppose I did. That was what the darkness was, no? When I woke, I went to the Chantry's gardens, as I always do. But that day, the rose bush in the corner had flowered. Everyone knew that bush was dead. It was grey and twisted and gnarled, the ugliest thing you ever saw. But there it was, a single beautiful rose. It was as though the maker stretched out his hand to say, even in the midst of this darkness, there is hope and beauty. Have faith. I suppose you will never understand. No one does. It's all right. I know what I know. And no one will ever make that untrue. Yes? Well, here I am. Quiet. It was a life suited for contemplation. In the cloister, away from the fuss and the flurry of the cities, I found peace. And in that stillness, I could hear the Maker. But it was not perfect. Some of my Chantry fellows were condescending. That is the nature of religious folk, I suppose. When I talked about my beliefs, that the Maker reveals himself in the beauty of his world, they treated me with disdain. They want to believe that he's gone, so that when he turns his gaze on them, it means they are special, chosen. He cannot possibly have love for all, the sick and the weary, the beggars and the fools. Thank you. Maybe I am wrong. But it is the Maker's place to decide if I am worthy, not men, not the Chantry. But there is work to be done, and I have talked enough for now. Yes? Well, here I am. What is meant by someone like me? And there were no beautiful, charming women in the cloisters, you think? <laughs> you would be wrong. There were many lovely young initiates in the Lothering cloister. All of them chaste and virtuous. <laughs> it added to their mystique. Because then, there were forbidden. And forbidden fruit is the sweeter, no? Flatterer. I, however, did not take vows, and so perhaps, I am not as enigmatic. The Chantry provides succor and safe harbor to all who seek it. I chose to stay and become affirmed. We affirm our belief in the Maker, in Andraste and the Chant, but other than that, there are no vows taken. I was a traveling minstrel in Orlais. Tales and songs were my life. I performed, and they rewarded me with applause and coin. And my skill in battle? Well, you pick up different skills when you travel, yes? Yes, of course. Um, let's move on. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? Where did you hear this? And did you not think that this could be historical fact and no longer true? <laughs> not all minstrels are spies. Most are just singers and storytellers. But some of them are... are what we call bards. Bards are minstrels and more. Spies, as you say. Some say there is a bard order, but I don't think this is true. Many bards work alone or in small groups, doing the bidding of a patron who pays for their services. If there is an organization behind it all, no one knows who they are. Do 
Nobles mostly. In Orlais, there is much rivalry amongst the highborn. They fight over land, influence, and the favor of the empress. But they cannot do this openly because it is impolite, and in public, they wear smiling faces and pretend to be civil. In secret, they plot and scheme to destroy each other. It is a game completely meaningless to anyone but its players. <coughs> I have revealed too much, it seems, but it doesn't matter what I used to be. It is the past. I found myself in Ferelden and sheltered from bad weather in the Chantry. And when the storm passed, I just did not want to leave. I like to see the Maker brought me here. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? My mother was from Denerim, and I consider myself a Ferelden. Mother served an Orlesian noblewoman who lived here when Orlais ruled. When Orlais was defeated and the common folk began to resent the presence of any Orlesian, the lady returned to Orlais. She took my mother with her. I was born in Orlais and did not set foot in Ferelden until much later. Mother was always telling me stories of her homeland. I think she missed it. Mother died when I was very young. Lady Cecilie let me stay with her. I had no one else. She was quite old then and she had me study music and dance to entertain her. It is unfair that I have more memories of Cecilie than my mother. Strangely, the only thing I really remember of Mother was her scent. She kept dry flowers in her closet amongst her clothes. Small white Ferelden wildflowers with a sweet fragrance. Mother called them Andraste's Grace. They were very rare in Orlais. But enough about that. Let us move on. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? I miss Valroyaux. Unlike other cities where the people are the lifeblood and the character, Valroyaux was her own person, and her people little more than decorations. There was always music in Valroyaux, streaming from the many windows, quiet refrains and triumphant choruses, and always floating above that all, the chant coming from the Grand Cathedral. It was magnificent. Oh, it would take me a day or two to talk about the many splendors of Orlais, her golden fields, her lush meadows. Of course, there are good things and bad things about Orlais, like anywhere else. Sometimes I miss it dearly, and sometimes I'm glad I'm rid of it. And you will laugh at this, but I miss the fine things I had in Orlais. Dresses, fine dresses and furs, and shoes, of course. One can't mingle with nobility with bad shoes, you see. Orlais is very fashionable, almost ridiculously so. But the shoes! Living with those ridiculous trends was worth it for the shoes. When I left Orlais, the fashion was shoes with delicate tapered heels and embellishments in the front. A ribbon, perhaps, or embroidery. In soft colors, of course, it was spring. I had my eye on a pair my shoemaker was working on. It was covered in pale blue silk with amber beads on the toe. The shoes made in Orlais were exquisite. Not at all like this clunky, fur-lined leather boots you have in Ferelden. Ugh, just look at them. Thank you. It's kind of you to say so, even wearing these mud-covered horrors. They're sturdy shoes, but sometimes a girl just wants to have pretty feet. Oh, I could talk about shoes all day, but we have things to do, don't we? 
Yes? Something you need? Um, I don't think you have the correct aptitude. I could give you some pointers though. You may be able to pass them on to someone you know. Let's just go over there, away from the others. For safety, yes? I expect there shall be daggers flying about willy-nilly for a time. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? Of course I do. I love stories far too much to keep them to myself. Everyone should be able to benefit from them, I think. Chantry Law says it is man's pride that created the Darkspawn. In ages past, the mages of the Tevinder Imperium ruled much of the world we know. And their pride? They thought their magics invincible and imagined that they were greater than the Maker himself. So thinking, they invaded his golden city, planning to take it for themselves and depose their own creator. But they were impure and full of sin. And it is with the sin that they tainted the golden city, corrupting it forever. The Maker cursed them and cast them from his sight. Wherever they went, they spread the taint of their sin. Any land that was touched by the taint became blighted and would suffer no life. Instead, the darkspawn arose to torment us and remind us of our hubris. Of course, Olesians enjoy telling stories. I shall tell you my favorite tale of Aveline, the Knight of Ole. A long time ago, a girl child was born to a farmer. He had hoped for a son, not a daughter, and so he told his wife to abandon the child in the woods. Before the cold could claim her, the baby was found by a tribe of Dalish elves who took pity on the poor mewling thing and raised her as their own. Aveline, for that is what they called her, grew strong and quick and clever under the guidance of the elves. She learned to wield a sword as well as any man, could kill a deer with an arrow at hundred paces, and was as graceful on the back of a horse as she was on foot. Aveline's Dalish guardians saw that she could easily best any Olesian chevalier in battle, and wanted to show the cruel humans the child they had left to die. They bestowed upon her a fine horse and armor, and sent her to prove herself to her people in the Grand Tourney. Now in those days, no woman was allowed to take up arms, let alone compete in the Grand Tourney, but Aveline kept her helmet on and was not discovered. <coughs> Aveline won many events and gained the approval of the adoring crowd. Eventually, she came face to face with the knight Kaleva in the Grand Melee. Aveline had already bested him in the joust, and Kaleva was determined not to lose a second time. Out of desperation to regain his honor, Kaleva tripped Aveline and tossed her to the ground, ripping off her helmet as he did so. Silence fell upon the arena as Aveline was revealed. Kaleva declared the previous competitions invalid. A woman had taken part, and this was not allowed. But the crowd cheered for Aveline. Kaleva was furious, for he had lost to a woman and was now being shamed. Blinded by his rage, he forced Aveline to her knees. Know your place, woman, cried he, and slit her throat. The son of the king, Prince Freyan was present. He recognized Aveline's skill and bravery and began to see the injustice done to the women in his land. When he was made king, he rewrote the laws of Ole so that women could also become chevalier. He honored Aveline and knighted her after her death. And to this day, any female who is knighted reveres Aveline the Brave, for she is the patron of all women chevalier. I know one, told to me by my mother a long time ago, it always chill me to the bone. Maybe you have heard of Flemeth? Ah, uh, are you sure? Was she THE Flemeth of legend? Flemeth, the devourer of men. Flemeth, mother of witches. Flemeth, demon touched, who dwells in the mist. Woo! <laughs>
Ferelden mothers scare their daughters with talk of Flemeth. They say that if you're bad, Flemeth will spirit you away and bind you to her forever. They also say that Flemeth mourns her lost beauty and will steal yours through your looking glass if she catches you. Flemeth's beauty was known throughout the land. She had hair like unto a moonless night, skin as pale as winter's first snow, and eyes as beautiful and perilous as the sea. When she came of age, she came to the attention of the Lord of High Ever, Conobar, and he took her for his wife. Conobar soon learned that his young bride had the gift of magic. He kept this a secret, for he feared that she would be taken from him. Flemeth stayed with Conobar for some years, and with his blessing, she practiced her art. And then one day, a young poet named Osen came to the castle. Flemeth was captivated by Osen's voice, and he by her beauty, and they fell in love. Flemeth longed to be with her true love, and she and Osen fled from Conobar's lands, seeking refuge in the Kokari wilds with the Chasin tribes. They lived there happily for many a year, till the day Flemeth received news that Conobar was dying and longed to see her face one last time. Flemeth's heart swelled with pity for the man who once was her husband and begged Osen to return to Conobar's side with her. But when Flemeth and Osen entered Hyeva, they were captured by Conobar's men and Osen was slain in front of Flemeth's eyes. Flemeth was imprisoned in the highest tower of the castle, there to await Conobar's judgment on her. Distraught at the loss of her love, Flemeth plotted revenge against her husband. She summoned a fey demon, intending for it to wreak vengeance on Conobar. But a spell went awry. The demon possessed Flemeth. Turning her into an abomination, the halls of the castle ran red with blood as Flemeth slaughtered Conobar and all his men. The last of Flemeth's humanity melted away, and at dawn, she stole back to the wilds to plot and scheme for a hundred years. They say she took to her side many chastened men, and with their help, begat her daughter witches, who even now prowl the dark places of the Kokari wilds. Which one? I have heard a little about how the elves gained their freedom from the Tevinter Imperium. When Andraste began her exalted march against the Imperium, the elves joined her cause to fight their masters. The great elven leader, Shatan, born in captivity, rose up to lead his people. He foresaw a future where the elves were free. Shatan was killed when Andraste was betrayed, but the elves continued to fight, eventually breaking free of the Imperium. The elves claimed the dales in the south and settled there in the land of their own. The elves lived in the dales for centuries. They resurrected the worship of the elven gods and would allow the building of no chantry. This angered the chantry, and the hostility between the two factions finally broke out in open war. The chantry says the elves struck first, but I do not know whether to believe it. The Chantry declared a wholly exalted march against the Elves, named for Andraste's similar march against the Winter. During the exalted march of the Dales, the Elven cities were sacked and the Elven state completely dissolved. Some of the Elves bitterly accepted their fates and surrendered to human rule, living in the human cities as second-class citizens. But others, still fiercely proud of their heritage, refused to bow to the humans, and instead became homeless wanderers. There were the elves of the Dales, the Dalish. Andraste was the Maker's chosen. The Maker had long since abandoned the world when the sound of her singing turned his ear. Beauty, grace and wisdom enraptured him, and he offered to take her from this flawed world to become his divine bride. But Andraste had an earthly husband and would not forsake him. Instead, she beseeched the Maker to return to his people once more. So earnest was her plea that the Maker was moved and promised that he would create a paradise on earth if all abandoned their false gods 
and turned once more to him. And this is why Andraste began her exalted march on the idolaters of the Tevinter Imperium. The Maker granted her his powers with which to smite her enemies. Andraste brought the Imperium to its knees, and her victories converted many to the worship of the Maker. Alas, it was the frailties of men that betrayed and killed Andraste. Her earthly husband, Maferath, a chieftain of the Alamari tribes himself, grew jealous as his wife's popularity and influence overshadowed his own. She was also revered as the Maker's betrothed, and Maferath began to see their own bond waning in significance as Andraste became ever more devoted to the Maker. Out of envy and spite, Maferath made a pact with the Archon Hesarian of Tevinta, allowing his beloved Andraste to be ambushed and captured. Andraste was burned at the stake in Minrathus, the capital of Tevinta. The Tevinta Chantry claims that in Andraste's last moments, Hesarian's heart softened and he heard the voice of the Maker telling him to end her suffering. He plunged his sword into her heart, and as her blood washed over his hands, he became one of the faithful. Dissenters said that the Archon only converted because he could not stem the tide of Andraste's cult, and was forced to do so to stay in power. We will never know for sure. Oh, you're so funny. Such rapier wit. Your furry friend here took offence at me getting near his food. He snapped at me. Look. Sometimes I forget that he's a war dog. That'll teach me. I once heard a really old legend about how the hound warriors in the days of the old tribes would feed their Mabari the flesh of the vanquished. Well, that's what I heard anyway. It would sometimes be human flesh. Oh, like you can tell the difference. For all you know, maybe you've already been fed something. Someone. It's not cannibalism if he's eating it, you know. Oh, look at what your fool dog placed in my pack. A putrid, half-eaten hair is not something a woman wants to find in her unmentionables. Dirty mongrel can have this back. There. And tell him not to do it again. I just did. I don't want it, you worthless fur bag. Oh, he's just trying to be manipulative, I can tell. I do it too. True warrior and worthy of respect. Why 
Why are we stopping? There are darkspawn to be fought. Is this delay needful? You are concerned. No need. I am fit enough to fight. No. People are not simple. They cannot be summarized for easy reference in the manner of the elves are a lithe, pointy-eared people who excel at poverty. I am. Decide. I am a Sten of the Beresad. I did not choose to be who I am any more than you did. The Antam are the eyes, hands, and mouth of the Kunari. We are how my people know the world. No, I didn't. Yes. There is no point to this. We are keeping the Darkspawn waiting. For the moment, you are the enemy of my enemy. Yes, I am Kunari. As long as you do not make yourself my enemy, I will aid you. I can promise nothing else. As you wish. You're a hard man to find. Where are my manners? The name is Levy. Levy Dryden. Did Duncan ever mention me? Levy of the coins? Levy the trader? Really? He never told you of old Levy? We've known each other for years. But here I am carrying on while you have a blight to stop. Don't want to waste your time. But you see, Duncan promised that together we'd look into something important for the Wardens. And for me. But poor Duncan's... Well, no more. A tragedy it is, at that. But I know he would want his work carried on, his pledge fulfilled. It's a bit of a tale, that is. But I'm the one who brought the Grey Wardens back to Ferelden. Well, I was one of the ones. There were a lot of us. Make us breath, I'm a bit nervous. Honoured to be here, really. After King Marek freed us from the Orlesians, the Grey Wardens begged the King's permission to come into Ferelden, some sort of internal business. Me and a mess of other Warden sympathisers spoke on behalf of your order. Tan Logain was very much against letting Orlesian Wardens in the Kingdom. But Marek, Andraste, bless him, was a fair-minded monarch and he let them in. So that's why I was there when the Wardens and their leader, Genevieve, presented herself to the King. The first Wardens in Ferelden in over a century. Proudest day of my life, that was. Duncan was a bit of a scamp back then. We were of an age and struck up a friendship. The King himself went with the Wardens on their mysterious business. When he returned, he rescinded King Ardlan's decree, and the Wardens came back to Ferelden for good. People say it's because the Wardens have become terribly unpopular. Just soaking up tires and not doing a bleeding thing for the Kingdom. I say that's bollocks, as recent events have shown. Marek was a bit of a visionary. A powerful mind, that one. In his travels with the Wardens, he must have seen how important their cause was. And been moved by it. There was some talk at court that he did it to improve relations with Orzammar. That might have factored into it, but make no mistake. King Marek was a giant among men. <sighs> that he was. Oh, his stomach's all a flutter. You're welcome. Well, as you know, my family's name is Mud around noble circles. My great-great-grandmother, Sophia Dryden, was the last Warden Commander of Ferelden back when the Wardens were known as Freeloaders. So King Arlen banished the Wardens, and he took House Dryden's land and titles. Hard to say. After King Arlen died, there was a civil war, loads worse than this one. And our family was on the run, hunted by enemies, with nary a friend in the world. But Dryden's are tough. 
we rebuilt, became merchants, and we never lost our pride. Our family's only crime was guarding the kingdom against the blight. We're not ashamed of that. I ask for the truth. My family reveres Sophia Dryden. We know she died at the old Grey Warden base, Soldier's Peak. We want evidence to clear her name. It won't restore our land or our titles, but it'll restore our honour. Well, no one's been to Soldier's Peak since Ireland's days. At least none that's come back. I spent years mapping the maze of tunnels to the peak, and I found the way a few years back. So I went to Duncan, I did, and I said that he could reclaim the old base and my family could have its honour. Darkspawn surfaced in southern Ferelden, and Duncan got plenty busy recruiting new wardens and meeting with good King Caelan. Duncan said he would help after the Battle of Ostagar, said there might be useful things at the peak, but he never had the chance. Soldiers peak a strategic and symbolic importance. Duncan said that it would be worth it right there. He also hoped to recover lost warden history and perhaps a few old relics. No one knows what's up there now. I can pick my way through the tunnels at the base of Soldier's Peak, but the place, well, they say it's haunted, and it'll be dangerous for certain. Will you think on it, at least? A thousand blessings upon you, Warden. I'll mark down the location on your map. When you arrive, we'll pick our way through the tunnels together. Good to see you, my timely rescuer. Bodon Fedic, at your service, once again. I saw your camp and thought to myself, what safer place to rest for the evening than in the camp of a Grey Warden? I'm perfectly willing to offer you a fine discount for the inconvenience of our presence. How does that sound? Good? Yes? Wonderful. Thank the gentleman, won't you, boy? Thank you, sir. We won't be a bother to you and your companions, I assure you. If you should need enchantments, simply talk to my boy. Otherwise, come speak with me. If there's anything I can do for you, please, please tell me. Hmm. I suppose since you told me about you being a Grey Warden, it's only fitting for me to be as open. I am originally from Orzammar, the famed dwarven city that lies beneath the stately Frostback Mountains. I was a merchant there, too. Merchant caste. These things are in the blood, you know. You can't just leave them behind. I ran a fairly successful business. Rare artifacts, you know. Old things, grand things. The nobles loved them. Reminded them of the lost glory days, I suppose. So, as I said, things were going well, but good things must come to an end. One day, a noble woman came to my store. She looked around for a bit and then started shrieking in dismay. Apparently, she believed that a pair of braces I had for sale once belonged to her brother. He'd been lost in a cave-in, you see, while on an expedition to clear out the dark spawn from one of the tunnels running close to the city. They were made specially for him. They're unique, she shrieked. He stole them from my poor brother's corpse. She had me arrested on the spot, of course. Nobles, they're touchy like that. Well, I didn't steal them. You see, I, I had been paying these castless thugs to venture out into the deep roads for me. The lost tigers. They're full of things that people left behind, 
Sometimes you can find a treasure. Something worth a little gold. That's exactly how I see it. The noble woman, she wasn't too happy with the theft of her brother's braces. I don't know what they planned for me, and I didn't want to find out. Bribed the guard that was watching me and took off for the surface first opportunity I got. Never look back. You're quite welcome. Now, is there anything the boy or I can get you? Look, we... we don't rob people, all right? We don't take things from people that need them. The things in the lost tags, what good did they do lying there? I brought them back to Orzammar, where people could look at them and remember. It's not all that different up here. There are places long abandoned by the humans everywhere. Even more now, with the Darkspawn coming. People flee from the Blight with good reason, but they forget things. Things with value and meaning. They leave them behind because they're frightened and desperate. And sometimes, my boy and I, we find our way to these places before the Horde descends, and we save these things. I take them away so the Darkspawn don't get them. Is that so bad? They destroy everything they touch. That's what I tell myself, too. Ah, these are dark times indeed. Dark times, my friend. Ah, yes. I'm married to a fine woman back in Denerim, it's true. She'd give me a son if she could, but uh, that's not likely to ever be. Sandal here. I found him in the deep roads years ago. Abandoned, I think. And he was never quite right in the head. I took him in, and I brought him with me when I came here to the surface. It may not be my blood, true, but I think of him as one. We left Orzammar. That's right, boy. Maybe one day we'll see it again. <laughs> Better than him living in mud and hiding from dark spawn and deep stalkers, isn't it? I was glad to take him in. It's not as if I don't benefit, mind you. Turns out the boys are natural working with enchantments. He might have even been leery addled. I never thought of that before, to be honest. Happens sometimes. He can work an enchantment into just about anything, however, given some time. Could probably open his own shop, if he knew how. Enchantment. <laughs> well, he does seem to enjoy it, at least. I hear from folks traveling the East Roads that there's werewolves in the Brazilian forest. Actual werewolves. They haven't been around since the days of Dane and his ilk. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. There's a nasty rumor going around that the Grey Wardens are evil and that they worship the Archdemon. They're the ones that cause the blight. They were getting upset, see, that there was no use for them anymore, so they summoned up the Archdemon to do their bidding. It would explain a great many things. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. I hear tell they held a funeral in Denaron for King Caelan. The Grand Cleric called for a full day of mourning, and there was a procession a mile long passing by the Brasier. It's too bad they don't have a body to properly burn. What happened to him at the hands of those creatures, it's unthinkable. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. Habron, daughter of the Earl of Southreach, has spent an exorbitant amount of her father's coin buying puppies. No one knows what happens to the puppies, and she buys a new one every week. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. Aurel Urien wasn't truly killed at Ostagar. His son, Lord Vaughn, hired Antivan Crows to kill his father before he ever reached the battlefield, only to first be killed by a mob of elves himself. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. There's talk that King Caelan was cheating on the Queen and she found out about it. That's why Tyrn Loghain abandoned Caelan at Ostagar. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. Some hunters who range into the Brazilian forest say that a Delish clan there has fallen to some kind of sickness. The Blight, most likely, poor sods. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. 
I've heard a rumor that the reason Queen Enora has never produced an heir is that she's barren. It's a curse from the maker for bringing a commoner into the royal line. Until someone of royal blood is put on the throne, there will never be an heir. It seems the royal line of Kalinod has been broken for good, no? That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. The crafters of the Pearl Brothel are threatening to close their doors if they aren't finally recognized as a true guild. Ha! Can you imagine? As if the men weren't blue enough. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. It's not just Darkspawn in the Horde, you know that? There are people with them. Folks who are sick with the blight and their minds are all twisted and mad. I heard tell of a man meeting his own brother on the field, yet when he called out to him, his brother didn't even recognize him and just attacked. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. I don't know what to tell you. Nothing I can think of at the moment. Hello. The boy's a bit simple, but he's rather good with enchantments. One of those tranquil fellas actually called him a... What was it now? A savant. I had no idea such a thing existed. He can fold lyrium into almost any weapon or piece of armor, though naturally some of the more extravagant materials will take more lyrium than others. It's a process that some of the master smiths back in Orzammar will perform, but my boy here is just as adept at it. Isn't that right, boy? Enchantment! And there you have it. What do you wish of me? If you must. I was not born such. Tis a skill of Flemeth's, taught over many years in the wilds. The chastened have tales of we witches, saying that we assume the forms of creatures to watch them from hiding. When a child is alone and separate from his tribe, that is when we strike, dragging the young boy kicking and screaming to our lair to be devoured. A most amusing legend. Changing her form, certainly. Devouring lost children, I cannot say. She has not done it in my experience, though in truth my lifespan is but a fraction of her own. Why do you ask? Is there something specific you wish to know? The form of an animal is different from my own. One may study the creature, learn to move as it does, think as it does. In time, this allows one to become as it is. I gain nothing by studying another human. I already am the same as they are. I learn nothing. So the answer is no, my human form is the only one I possess. There were nights when the wilds called to me, it is true. You look upon the world around you and you think you know it well. I have smelled it as a wolf, listened as a cat, proud shadows that you never dreamed existed. But my life is as a human. I am under no illusions to the contrary. They do not shy away from me. To their senses, I believe I seem like any other of their species. As to what they think, I truly cannot say, just as I am still human, no matter my form, they are still animals. Thus they cannot speak, even were I to ask. No, tis not unheard of in the remote corners of the world. There are traditions of magic outside of the circle of magi, despite what those mages would have you believe. Some of these traditions are old, indeed, passed down as carefully guarded law from one generation to the next. The zealots of the Chantry would uproot all such practitioners if they could. But as luck have it, some still exist. My mother is such a one. I am surprised you think so. Still, it is a pleasant thing to hear. 
Anyone with sufficient will. But the act of transformation is a magical one. Tis a spell and thus requires a mage's talents. If you had a notion to learn such a skill for yourself, sadly, you must remain disappointed. Indeed. Have you an opinion on my abilities, then? Am I an unnatural abomination to be put to the torch? Oh! You're simply full of surprises, little man, aren't you? But enough of such talk, let us proceed lest the dust gather on us. I am grateful. What do you wish of me? If you must. Possibly, if I had the desire to. I do not. I was told to accompany you and to help you, and that I shall. This may extend to the teaching of my mother's skills in time. For now, I simply do not know you well enough. I promise nothing. What do you wish of me? If you must. Why do you ask me such questions? I do not probe you for pointless information, do I? Beg pardon then while I jump for joy. What is it you asked if I grew up in the wilds? A curious question. Where else would you picture me? For many years it was simply Flemeth and I. The wilds and its creatures were more real to me than Flemeth's tales of the world of man. In time I grew curious. I left the wilds to explore what lay beyond, never for long. Brief forays into a civilized wilderness. Would you not do the same? Your world is an unforgiving and cold place. The wilds I hail from is home to me and I a natural denizen. For all that I had been taught, however, the truth of the civilized lands proved to be... overwhelming. I was unfamiliar with so much. So confident and bold was I, yet there was much that Flemeth could never have prepared me for. <laughs> Equal parts daring and foolhardy, perhaps. Only once was I accused of being a witch of the wilds, and that by a chastened who happened to be travelling with a merchant caravan. He pointed and gasped, and began shouting in his strange language, and most assumed he was casting some curse upon me. I acted the terrified girl, and naturally, he was arrested. Men are always willing to believe two things about a woman. One, that she is weak, and two, that she finds him attractive. I played the weakling and battered my eyelashes at the captain of the guard. <laughs> Child's play. The point being that I was able to move through human lands fairly easily. Whatever humans think a witch of the wild looks like, tis not I. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? To begin with, yes. What is the point of touching my hand? I find it an offensive intrusion. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes. How to eat at a table. How to bargain without offending. None of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told. But then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. When I returned to the wilds last, I swore to Flemeth that I had no intention of leaving again. Yes? Let's ignore the entire Darkspawn threat and the presence of a simpleton as your only other Grey Warden ally, then. Not that I lack appreciation for the intent of your comment. Thank you. Well, let's get on with it before the ground opens up and swallows us, yes? Yes? Full of questions, are you? 
I cannot teach you, no. But any other mages that cared to learn, yes, I could do that. Send whoever you wish my way, and I shall teach them what I can in the camp, provided they possess the will to even make the attempt. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> you are very cute to ask so many questions. Really? Perhaps we should be wrapped in ribbons and adorned with flowers. So cute are we, too. <laughs> My mother has been hunted from time to time, yes by Templar fools like Alistair, which should tell you how successful they generally were. Flemeth made a bit of a game of it, in fact. The Templars would come again, and she would look at me and smile and say that the fun was to begin once more. They came with as much swagger and arrogance as they did self-righteousness. Pity them if you wish, for they held none for us. Flemeth would warn them once, it was a warning they inevitably failed to heed. And then the true game began. Often Flemeth would use me as bait, <laughs> a little girl to scream and run and lure the Templars deeper into the wilds and to their doom. Sometimes, eventually. Thankfully, the wilds is a vast place. Once they found us, Flemeth would simply move us elsewhere, and we would be lost within the forest once again. I did not understand the danger we faced until I was much older. I had never heard of apostates or maleficarum. Perhaps they did. Still, I do not begrudge them doing what they believe is necessary. The Chantry sees any mages not leashed to the Circle of Magi as apostates. And apostates could become Maleficarum, evil mages that resort to blood magic and become demon-enslaved abominations. It may even be true. Still, those of us who prefer freedom see no reason to submit. Oh? I hope you're not simply being agreeable. It would be a refreshing change. Enough of this talk. Let us return to the task at hand. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? You mean, is she truly the Flemeth of legend and story? Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the chastened still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience? No doubt such a tale has mutated much over time and telling. I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. As the tale is sung by the bards, there was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful, a fair lass in a land of barbarian men, the desire of any who saw her. Many centuries before this land was even named Ferelden, the tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the bard, and fled the castle of her husband, the dread Lord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity. In truth, my mother claims that twas Osen who was her husband, and Conobar the jealous Lord, who looked on from afar. Lord Conobar approached young Osen and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife, and Osen agreed. Aye, it was. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement in the first place. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osen was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge.
That was not the point. Conobar had no honor, so she would not have him. Flemeth begged the spirits to aid her, and twas they who slew Conobar. The demon the legend tells of came later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the Lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. You ask if I have sisters? I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds, after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So, should I believe I am her first? I doubt that too. The demon within her has transformed her into... something else. An abomination, perhaps, some would say. I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other, were it lucky enough to find her. How often is this usually? Always? If not always, then when is it not true? There are more things in this world and the next than you or I could ever hope to understand. What Flemeth became is a mystery. I suspect even to her. I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Often it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, tis true, but I find myself curious nevertheless. Ah, then you have my sympathies for what it is worth. Which is very little, I am certain. It matters not. Let us move on. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I assume you are actually asking whether Flemeth herself gave birth to me. Truly? I do not know. I once asked Flemeth that very question and she merely laughed at me. It is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man, or perhaps change to a more attractive form to attract him willingly. I find it more difficult to imagine her with child. It seems likely, does it not? In an animal form, a babe could easily be spirited away and raised as Flemeth's own. I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another. And Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. I would have nothing in common with them, nor any need for what they might provide. Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe them the lesser. You suppose it's true? Tis true. Take yourself. You do not honestly desire such things from me, do you? Tis better to be free of such cloying and cluttering delusions as love. I do not consider it a limitation. Not leaping into a burning building also happens to be an experience best avoided. I tire of this discussion. Let us move on, shall we? 
Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> yes? At times, perhaps. A world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, twas to the trees. For a time, but one can only remain a child for so long. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones, and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. She was not. Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power, and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. I was heartbroken. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. They did indeed. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely. But such was how it had to be. I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror. But such fantasies have no place amidst reality. Yes? We are in camp, so tis as good a time as any. What's this? <laughs> tis a rather odd discussion you seem to desire. Leaning in so closely. Oh, it's humor you desire. Hmm? I didn't realize comedy had anything to do with this. How true. Let us do it right, then. Is cold in my tent all alone. So you shall come to my tent? But whatever shall we do in that tiny little space together while we wait for it to warm? Good, then let us waste no more time with foolish talk. I see the stories they tell of Grey Warden endurance are not exaggerated. Not at all. Legends abound regarding such figures as Garahel, sordid though they may be. The unanswered question, of course, is whether the endurance exists because of the taint within you, or because the Grey Wardens are by nature so very healthy. I enjoy the thought that tis a little of both. Natural prowess, driven by a darker side. That is entirely up to you. Simply know that I have no designs on your independence. I wish only to do what I desire, and if that coincides with what you desire, then so be it. And should you decide not to continue our 
misadventure, then so be it. Very simple, is it not? Then we should get along marvelously. <laughs> Come then, let us be off before the others begin to stare. Hmm? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> To you, you know, about why I left Orle. I didn't feel like talking about it then. What happened to me? Maybe it will affect us, maybe not, but you should know. I came to Ferelden and the Chantry because I was being hunted in Orle. I was framed. Betrayed by someone I thought I knew and could trust. Marjolaine. She was my mentor and friend. She taught me the bardic arts, how to enchant with words and song, to carry myself like a highborn lady, to blend in as a servant. The skills I learned, I used to serve her, my bardmaster, because I loved her and because I enjoyed what I did. You can say it was my fault. There was a man I was sent to kill. I was to bring Marjolaine everything he carried. I don't know who this man was. She gave me a name and a description, and I hunted him down. I found documents on his body, sealed documents. My curiosity got the better of me. Something told me that I needed to know what was in those letters. Marjolaine had been selling all kinds of information about Orle to other countries, Nevara and Antiva among others. It was treason. Some. But I had always assumed Marjolaine only operated within Orle. This was an unhappy surprise for me. My life as Bard taught me that my loyalties should be kept fluid. My concern was not that she was a traitor, but that her life would be in danger if she was caught. Orle has been at war with so many countries, it takes a harsh view of such things, as I later discovered. I should have left well alone, but I didn't. I had to tell Marjolaine I feared for her life. She brushed aside my concern. She admitted her guilt, but said it was in the past. That is why the documents had to be destroyed, she said. I believed her. I kept believing up till the moment they showed me the documents, altered by her hand, to make me look the traitor. Yes, the Orlesian guards, they captured me, did terrible things to make me confess and reveal my conspirators. It was a traitor's punishment I endured, and at the end of it, all that awaited me was eternity in an unmarked grave. No. Survival was my only concern at the time. The skills Marjolaine taught me were good for something at least. I broke free when I saw the opportunity. I did not seek Marjolaine out. If she thought I was coming for her, she would have me caught again. I was tempted to confront her. I was furious, betrayed. But what could I do against her? And so I fled to Ferelden, to the Chantry and the Maker. Ferelden protected my person, and the Maker saved my soul. And that is the reason I am here. The real reason. No more lies between us, at least in this. It feels good to have this off my chest. Thank you for listening and understanding. <laughs>